I'm continuing a series called Let's Talk About It, where we are talking about some of the different doubts and maybe skeptical attitudes that people in society have. It was inspired originally by a guy who was a Christian, and then he lost his faith, and he publicly posted this statement. And I read the longer version of that the first week, and I'll just kind of read you a, a shorter version of it here. He said, time for some real talk. I'm genuinely losing my faith, and it doesn't bother me. I want genuine truth, not the I just believe it kind of truth. He said, science keeps piercing the truth of every religion. Christianity just seems like another religion at this point. So I'm going to talk about that today, and we've been talking about different subjects in this series, and I want to throw this out to you. If you have a question that comes up during this series, you can just text your question. Text GCQA to 555-888. And you'll get easy instructions to follow. But any question you might have, um, go ahead and throw that out there. And maybe we'll take time to answer in the coming weeks. But listen, there's no question that you might have that as Christians, we're afraid to talk about. Because we stand on the truth of God's word. We know God is truth. And we can trust everything that he says. And so we're willing to talk about even the difficult issues. And I want to key in today on... The phrase that he said, he said, science keeps piercing the truth of every religion. So the title of this message today is Science and Skeptics and God, Oh My. (laughs) If you're taking notes, you can write that down. It'll help you remember what we talked about today. Is it true that science is piercing the truth of every religion? Well, man, someone leads you to think that that is the truth. I remember as a young adult, I went to Arizona State University for my bachelor's degree, and I was in class, you know, and I had been warned by many people that being raised in a Christian home, I could expect to go to university and hear from people who don't believe the things that I was raised to believe. And so I kind of expected that, and I was kind of guarded against that, and I wasn't the strongest Christian at the time, but on the other hand, I like to fight. So... I was just kind of waiting, you know, and I remember one day a professor said, yeah, the Bible has been proven by science to be nothing more than fairy tales. And, you know, I'm sitting there in that moment, and I think, like a lot of us would feel, I felt a certain degree of insecurity, and my stomach kind of sank, because on one hand, I I believe what I believe, but on the other hand, you kind of wonder, like, what if science does disprove what I believe. I don't want to be just like some dumb religious person that has my mind closed to the truth. And so you you can wrestle with these types of thoughts. You hear from so many people in society that say, man, these things in the Bible have been proven to be false. And as a Christian, you might think that science is something that could undermine your faith. I want to talk about that. Surveys show that nine out of 10 Americans believe in a God of some sort, but I think many of people uh, who say they believe in God would still separate faith from science and believe that the two are incompatible. I think some Christians aren't sure what to do with science. I'm going to start out reading from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. It says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. In other words, people that don't follow God are hopelessly confused. Now read verse 18 with me. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. This describes what people who don't know God do. They close their minds and harden their hearts against God. That means that even if you put the truth right in front of their face, they wouldn't want to see it. Their heart wouldn't be open to it because their heart has a hard shell around it preventing truth from even coming in. Now, science studies the physical world, and the Bible tells us that God came into our physical world, the world that he created, And he made eternal life possible physically and spiritually through faith in Jesus Christ. So the purpose of the Bible is not to explain all of nature, but to reveal our sinful nature and to show us God's righteous nature and how through Jesus we can live. Now, we said this last week that God, he inspired everything that's in our Bibles 
He worked through 40 different authors who wrote what the Holy Spirit led them to write over a period of about 1,600 years. And they tell a story that is continuous and it really works together. It tells the same story. Now, these authors, they described the world as they saw it. So they use their own language, they use their own observations, even as the Holy Spirit led them in what words to write. Think about this. Many of these authors were writing scripture thousands of years ago, but even in their ancient descriptions of the world around them, they don't write anything that contradicts scientific fact. How incredible is that? You can't say that for other religions. In fact, if you look at the holy scriptures of many other world religions, you'll see that they're riddled with things that are scientifically impossible. So like, for example, the Quran teaches that the world is flat, teaches that the sun sets in a muddy pool at the end of every day. Turned out not to be right. Or Joseph Smith, he wrote that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth, which is interesting because it had to be edited over 3,000 times after that first draft. We have different definitions of correct. And it was also filled with things that were scientifically not correct. He wrote in the Book of Mormon that people with dark skin have that because they were cursed by God. They then later edited that out, not surprisingly. They also claimed that many large civilizations existed in North America that there's never been one shred of archaeological evidence for. And so to believe what the Book of Mormon says, you would have to essentially turn off the thinking part of your soul and just blindly trust what you're reading. And it's not surprising that we find this because all other religions are man-made. And so they were created by men who were limited to their own thoughts and ideas. But the Bible that we trust as Christians came from God who created the heavens and the earth and established the laws of science. And so it makes sense that we alone have a holy text that lines up with scientific facts. I want you to understand this, church. Scientific facts support Christianity even when scientists don't. The actual facts do support Christianity even when the people who interpret them don't support what we believe. History supports what we believe because God is eternal. Archaeology supports what we believe because the Bible is historical. Astronomy does because God created the heavens and the earth. Physics supports what we believe because God is the one who established the laws that govern us. Genetics do as well because God is the one who designed mankind. It's only recently that culture has tried to pit science against Christianity. But for most of human history, the greatest minds, the brightest thinkers in humanity were also Christians. Do you know that? Otto Brunsfeld, the father of botany, Francis Bacon developed the scientific method, Galileo, Blaise Pascal, who was a math and physics and theological genius, Isaac Newton, uh, you've probably heard of him, Johannes Kepler developed the laws of planetary motion, Louis Pasteur, he's a microbiologist that discovered vaccination, Michael Faraday established electromagnetic theory, you've heard of a Faraday cage, all those guys were Christians. Now the Bible wasn't given to be a science textbook but rather to give us soul-saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But what's so cool is that when the Bible does describe the natural world around us, it has incredible foresight and accuracy and trustworthiness. I'm going to kind of go through some examples for you today. And I know this is kind of an academic type of message, but I think that's okay because the Word of God tells us that we're supposed to love Him with our heart and our mind. And so the more we understand with our mind, the easier it is to love God with our heart. So I, I, hope, I hope you'll bear with me as I give you some examples. Let me talk about archaeology. I want to show you a picture of the walls of Jericho. This is the remains of the city of Jericho as described in the Old Testament. The story says that the Israelites went around that city, marched around for seven days, and the seventh day they went around seven times, they blew their trumpets, and the walls fell down. The Israelites rushed in, burned the city to the ground as they were conquering the land of Canaan. Well, archaeologists have found the city of Jericho. Guess what they found? 
The walls have all fallen down. After the walls fell down, it was burned completely, just like the Bible says. They do point out that there is this one section of wall that is still standing, which is really interesting because the Bible talks about Rahab, who lived in the city, who helped hide the spies of Israel. And they promised her that God would spare her from destruction. You know that she lived, the Bible says, in her house was built into the walls of the city. So it's very possible that God allowed a section of the wall to remain standing where Rahab and her family lived. That's exactly what archaeologists have found. And I could give you thousands of examples like this. Because the Bible describes actual historical events. It's not a fairy tale for children. It's the most trustworthy ancient historical document that's ever been written. Let me talk about oceanography, the study of the oceans. In Psalm 8, verse 6, it says, You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, the fish of the sea. Look at this phrase. Whatever passes along the paths of the sea. There was a guy named Matthew Mari. In 1806, he was born. And he noticed this phrase, the paths of the sea. And he said, if God says there are paths in the sea, I'm going to find them. And he is the one who found the global ocean currents and developed our modern trade routes based on the fact that the Bible hinted at the existence of such things. Job 38 verse 16 says, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Okay, so in Job's day, people weren't deep diving to the bottom of the ocean's floor. It wasn't until 1977 that we discovered hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, and it was actually in 2003 that a professor of planetary earth sciences at the University of California, Santa Cruz, his name is Andrew Fisher, he discovered that seawater sinks into the seafloor's crust, and then as it's heated by subterranean magma, it rises back through underwater springs miles away. See, the more time goes by, the more the Bible is proven to be trustworthy. We didn't know that. Job didn't know it either until just recently. Physics, chemistry describe very interesting things we see in the Bible. Job 28, verse 25, it says, God, when he gave to the wind its weight and a portion to the waters by measure. You know, Aristotle, a famous philosopher and scientist, he theorized that air could possibly have weight a thousand years after this was written. Isn't that interesting? But Job, he wrote this inspired by the Holy Spirit. Or the first law of thermodynamics teaches that energy is constant, it just changes form. Think about what it says in Genesis 2, verse 1. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. Creation was completed. That means there's no new energy. It's just the same energy changing form. The second law of thermodynamics basically says that disorder is increasing in the universe. As time goes on, the universe is running down. Here's what Psalm 102 says. Long ago you laid the foundations of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing you will change them like a garment and discard them. How did the author of this psalm know thousands of years ago that the universe is winding down and decay is increasing and disorder is increasing? How would he know that unless the author was inspired by God? And there's also a good little sub-note here. This is why as Christians, we should be good stewards of our planet because God put us here to be good stewards of all the things that he created. But as Christians, we shouldn't obsessively worry about the planet because God already told us that it's going to be destroyed and we're going to receive a new one. Yes. So there's a lot of hope there, right? We're going to get a new planet, a better planet, a better universe. How many parents have ever helped their kids with science projects, right? Mine did. You probably did the whole project for them because it was just faster. <laughs> you know, God does the same thing. In Genesis 6:15, he told Noah, make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. So here's a life-size reproduction of the biblical ark made to the proper scale. You can go visit it in uh, Kentucky. 
It's the largest timber frame structure in the world. Interesting, in 1993, a study was done by South Korean ship researcher. Uh, it was called Chriso Center by Dr. Sean Hyung. He's not a Christian, not a creationist. And what he did was he compared 12 different ship holes, different ship shapes, the holes in different shapes, and he found that no modern design outperformed the 4,300-year-old biblical design. The biblical ark, they found, perfectly balances the demands of stability, strength, and comfort, which all shipbuilders have to fight to balance. And I think it's very interesting that the Bible's ark has the same proportions of modern cargo ships. Experts say they could survive, it could survive 100-foot waves easily. And I think it's interesting because other cultures have flood stories in them. For example, the Epic of Gilgamesh. It makes sense that if a flood actually happened, that many cultures would tell the story in different ways, even though maybe the details might get changed or they might add different features. Well, the Epic of Gilgamesh tells about a flood, and it describes an ark, but in that story, the ark is a cube, a 200 by 200 foot cube with a stone roof. Now, you don't have to be a physics genius to know that you put a cube in the water, top weighted, it's gonna, it's definitely not gonna be seaworthy, probably gonna kill everybody inside. But the Bible records the actual historical details and they're accurate and perfect. Isn't that incredible? Biology lines up with scripture. The Bible talks about germ theory. It's interesting, 1845, Dr. Ignis Simmelweis in Vienna, he noticed that 30% of women giving birth experienced deaths after childbirth. He found out that doctors were examining the bodies of dead patients and then going straight in to deliver babies without washing their hands. He said, maybe we should wash our hands. So they did, they started washing their hands and death, the death rate dropped from 30% to less than 1%. Now here's what's funny, his findings actually conflicted with the established scientific opinion and medical practices of doctors at that time, and he was ridiculed by the medical community. He couldn't even give a scientific explanation for why his findings actually were the way they were, and other doctors mocked him for suggesting that they should wash their hands. And then they did start to wash their hands, and it wasn't even until later they realized they need to use running water when they wash their hands instead of just a dish. Look at what Leviticus 15, verse 13 says. And when he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes, and bathe his body in running water. Then he shall be clean. Isn't that interesting? That God was telling his people in the civil law that he gave them how to maintain cleanliness and sanitation. Before, scientists knew why it works. Deuteronomy 23, verse 12 it's my favorite verse. It says, you must have a designated area outside of the camp where you can go relieve yourself. <laughs> it's my life verse. Uh, Each of you must have a spade as part of your equipment. Whenever you relieve yourself, dig a hole with the spade and cover the excrement. You know, don't be rude. Cover that poo. <laughs> right? Dig a hole, bro. Like, think about, in third world countries today, people still dump their feces into the same river that they drink out of and wash their clothes. But thousands of years ago, before we understood that improper sanitation leads to the outbreak of disease, God told his people how to properly dispose of their waste. That's really interesting, isn't it? Leviticus 13, verse 46 says, As long as a serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place outside the camp. So God was describing how to quarantine the sick. This wasn't implemented by modern medicine until almost 2,900 years later. In fact, the Black Death killed millions of people because they didn't separate the sick from the healthy. The Bible talks about blood and how important it is. Leviticus 17, verse 11 says, For the life of the body is in its blood. Now think about this. The Bible tells us life of the body is in its blood. Just a couple hundred years ago, they were intentionally bleeding people who were sick. 
In fact, the day that George Washington died, they drained 80 ounces of blood from his body in 12 hours. It was 40% of his blood volume. But the Bible tells us the life of the body is in the blood. And today, scientists know that they can get all the information they need about your DNA and your organs and diseases from your blood. And maybe we should give sick people blood rather than take it. The Bible tells us, church, that you are not here by accident, that God created you. Whereas the theory of evolution is that you come from goo. That's what it says. Maybe you've seen a picture like this before that says that man, he came from ape, and over time he started walking and then, you know, shaving, using tools, got a lot smarter, and then today we have man as we know him. I know some of the ladies in the house might think that we still have some evolving to do. (laughs) And I know, I saw this picture growing up um, in science class at high school. You know that today they're actually not putting this picture in as many textbooks because there's absolutely no fossil evidence to back this up. There are fossils of monkeys and apes, and there are fossils and remains of people, but not monkey people. And so over the years, there's been many times that scientists have said, we found it, we found the missing link. Like maybe you heard about Nebraska man. Uh, For many years, they thought he was the missing link. The whole thing was concocted off of a pig tooth. Like, oops. There's another guy called Piltdown man, they called him, a missing link. But it turned out to be a human cranium with an orangutan jaw, a big scam. They thought they found a missing link for a while. Turned out it was just a Seahawks fan. It's a work in progress, you know. I couldn't resist. <laughs> so now they've given up looking for missing link fossils and stuff. They just say that scientists, most scientists believe that man came from apes because of DNA evidence. And they think that, you know, because mankind and apes have similarities in our DNA, that shows that. We share the same ancestor. But as a Christian, we would argue, yeah, there are similarities in the DNA, about 70% similar when you factor in all the different things. But that's not because we share the same ancestor. It's because we share the same creator. Right? You know, like if you saw a car and you saw a bicycle, they share some of the same types of parts. But you wouldn't just assume that that bicycle evolved into that car. You would say maybe they both have wheels and have similar materials and then because they were made by the same people. And that's why so much of creation around us, there are similar building blocks used and it makes sense because we share the same creator. We come from the same creator. Humans, though, were created in the image of God uniquely. Mankind alone has the spirit of God within us and the ability to fellowship with God. We were given dominion over the animals and creation by God. In Acts 17, verse 26, it says, From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. It's very important, I think, to remember that The evolutionary ideas that came from Darwin, they have actually fueled a lot of the racist attitudes in our world today. They've contributed to genocides and atrocities. And of course, racism existed before Darwin, but evolution, the theory of evolution, gave a lot of Europeans a scientific excuse to abuse Africans and Australian Aborigines. Many Aborigines were killed and actually taken to London and put up as museum exhibits as the missing link between ape men and humans. A pygmy man named Atta Benga was actually placed on exhibit in the Bronx Zoo in the monkey house because of evolution being used as a justification to treat people groups from Africa and Aborigines and Mongols as inferior races to the Europeans of that day. In contrast, 
The Bible explains that all men are created equal in the image of God and of one blood. The Bible tells us there's only one race, the human race. There are no inferior races, just mankind made in the image of God. DNA confirms this today. DNA is a really interesting thing. It's complex. We don't even understand it yet. Uh, But the DNA code that gives life to everything, scientists say, interestingly, that it's like a language in a sense, which I I think is interesting. It reminds me how the Bible says that God spoke the world into creation. The Washington Post published an article that said that a study was done of 53 different population groups, and all people fall into one of three groupings, one of three categories, Europeans, Asians, and Africans, descend from three different groups, which perfectly lines up with what the Bible says, that all living people descended from the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Isn't that a coincidence? In order for evolution to change goo into you, new DNA and genetic information has to be added to simpler organisms for you to grow and become a more complex organism. You can't just alter the existing DNA or mutate what exists to get from bacteria to a walking, talking human being. But what we find is that genetically, mankind and creation has been devolving over time. Genetically, we are actually breaking down. There are more mutations today, more deformities, and there's less genetic information in our DNA than there was before, which is the opposite of what evolutionists would have expected. The gene pool is actually shrinking, not expanding. Because of the curse of sin affecting us this way, that actually means that Adam and Eve and their kids, they would have had less genetic mutations, less deformities, and higher IQs than we have today. It's very interesting how this all confirms what the Bible talks about. Astronomy, the study of the universe, confirms what the Bible tells us. Job 26, verse 7 says, God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Hangs the earth on nothing. Throughout history, many civilizations and different religions, Hinduism, Chinese religion, Native American religions, they all thought that the earth rested on the back of animals like giant turtles or elephants. But the Bible wrote, God hangs the earth on nothing, describing gravity. Isaiah 40, verse 22 says, God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. Isn't that interesting? This scripture was written hundreds and hundreds of years before Aristotle theorized the earth might be round. And many in those days imagined the earth as flat, but the Bible tells us it's a circle. And that's you know, how they would have been able to uh, understand it at that time. Jeremiah 33, verse 22 says, And as the stars of the sky cannot be counted. Before Galileo invented a better telescope, scientists thought there were a thousand stars in the sky. A thousand. Now, if there's a thousand, you could probably count them eventually. But the Bible says, can't count them. And then later, scientists realize, you can't count them. There's just (laughs) so many out there, you can't even count them. And then there's even more than we would ever be able to discover because of different factors. The Bible also describes that time had a beginning and that the universe had a beginning. All these things line up with scripture, but scientists have sometimes taken time to catch up. Aristotle, he was a philosopher and scientist, he theorized that the universe had existed eternally. Later, science did catch up to the Bible and scientists agreed with Christians when they believed that, no, the universe had a beginning. Now, people often wonder, how old is the universe? How old is the earth? And there are two big, I'll say main ideas about this. I'm going to talk about both of them for a moment. There's the theory of young earth creationism. As Christians, these are the two viable options, really. Young earth creationism states that God, he created the heavens and the earth, the way that Genesis says, but the days were 24-hour literal days, and he supernaturally developed everything very quickly, and that the earth would only be 6,000 to 10,000 years old based on the genealogies in the Bible. Um, 
And so that's a possibility that a global flood then destroyed the dinosaurs and many of uh, the animals that existed at that point. What's interesting is that the idea that the, that the Earth is four and a half billion years old, this idea didn't come about until very, very recently. So when Darwin's theory of evolution developed in 1859, when his book was released, all of a sudden, this idea that man evolved from goo required a much older Earth. If the Earth is young, then evolution couldn't happen the way that Darwin theorized. So scientists started putting a lot of pressure on geologists to come up with an older date for the Earth. And they came back in the late 19th century, and they said, okay, we figured it out. Based on the sedimentary layers, our theory is the Earth is 100 million years old. 100 million years, they said. That was their best guess. And then in 1926, they developed radiometric dating, like radiocarbon dating, and they came eventually up with this number four and a half billion years. I want you to understand, as intelligent thinking Christians, that we can't 100% trust that concept. It's based on a lot of assumptions. James Hutton, he theorized that the present must be the key to the past. And what he meant is that the way things are today must be the way that they've always been. And so by observing natural phenomenon today, we can figure out how long it must have taken to get to this point. That's how they worked their way back to four and a half billion years. That's called uniformitarianism, the way things have been, always been that way including the past rates of erosion and genetic mutations and radioactive decay. It must have always been the same, so everything must be very old. But there's a lot of evidence to believe that that's not true, that things haven't always been the way that they are now. For example, we know it's a scientific fact that the strength of the magnetic field of Earth has decreased by 10% just in the last century. They theorized that the strength of the magnetic field could have been very different over history and that it actually reversed polarization at different times. And there's a lot of evidence that the Earth might not be as old as radiometric dating leads them to believe. That things could have developed a lot, of, a lot faster than what we would assume. You know, we look at something like the Grand Canyon and we think that must have taken forever. And it makes sense that we would assume that. But think about this. As a result of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, 600 feet of rock were deposited instantly nearby. Okay? Then two years later, a mud flow happened in that area, and it eroded a canyon system 100 feet deep. This was 140th scale of the Grand Canyon, developed in just two years, showing that things that look old, well, we think they're old based on assumptions. We don't definitely no. Young Earth creationists argue that a global flood could have caused a lot of the things that look very old today. There's evidence that the dating methods that they use can be very flawed. For example, they took a lava sample from the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1986, and they tested it 10 years later with argon-40 dating, and it had a calculated age of 350,000 years. Another 50-year-old 50 50 year lava flow in New Zealand, they did three different tests on it, which yielded ages of 133 million years, 197 million years, and 3.9 billion years. Just showing that we should take some of these things with a grain of salt. Now, few scientists today believe that the Earth is young, and I want you to understand, Christians, that there is a lot of peer pressure in the scientific community to go along with the mainstream thought. Like, I'm not a weird conspiracy theorist or anything, but there's a lot of pressure because if you disagree with the mainstream thought, you'll lose funding for grants, you'll be ostracized by the community, you'll get labeled a wacko. And there's a lot of pressure. So, like, Mark Armitage is a guy, he was fired from California State University. Why? What did he do wrong? He discovered inside a Triceratops horn fossil soft tissue. And scientists said that can't be possible. It's got to be like 65 million years old. There can't be soft tissue. They thought he was trying to further his Christian beliefs. They fired him. He won a wrongful termination lawsuit. And it just shows that the scientific community doesn't want 
to find things that don't go along with mainstream thoughts, especially those that seem to support the theory of evolution. Now, paleontologists in the last 20 years have been shocked. They're starting to find more and more soft tissue inside dinosaur bones, which shouldn't be able to last that long. Like they found soft tissue inside the bones of a T-Rex they dated at 68 million years old. And now I'm starting to read about carbon dating being done on some of this soft tissue. And some of these dinosaur bones are coming back younger than 40,000 years old which is interesting because you can only do carbon dating on something younger than 60,000 years old, otherwise there's no more carbon in it. But it's just to show us that some of these dating methods that we've been told are so trustworthy might not be as trustworthy as we've been led to believe. Another very popular theory is called the day-age theory, and people who hold this theory, they, they call it old earth creationism, that the earth could be Old and as Christians, this could still align very well with everything the Bible says. When the Bible says days, what we interpret as days in English language, it uses the Hebrew word yom originally. The Hebrew word yom had different meanings. It could mean a literal 24-hour day, or it could mean an unspecified amount of time. So we've interpreted it days, but it's open to debate. And old earth creationists they believe the earth could be four and a half billion years old. They still believe that eventually God made a historical Adam and Eve. Oftentimes they believe that the flood in Genesis was a regional flood in the Mesopotamia era or area, and that it would have still been accurate in Hebrew to talk about it covering the whole earth because that was the whole earth where mankind existed in that day. Now that's a long conversation. I don't have time to get into all the details of that, but you can make those theories also align perfectly with what the Bible says and not compromise the inerrancy of scripture. Really, really smart Christians hold both theories and could be right. They make great arguments. I have spent hundreds of hours reading about these theories. I turn into a total nerd when I start reading this stuff, you guys. I, I mean, I just start reading all these different articles, and I'm just like, oh, what about this, what about this? And then I'm like, I can't use any of this in my sermon. Everybody will be asleep. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to have to bet which one is right. Because really, it doesn't matter. The Bible isn't trying to tell us when the heavens and earth were created, but whom by they were created. They were created by God. That's what we were told. That was the point. That's what God wanted us to know. Now, science and Christians agree the universe had a beginning and that a remarkable set of factors had to be just right for life to exist. And I think one of the best evidences for a creator is the fine tuning of the universe. So I want you to check out this video. From galaxies and stars down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, 
the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant. A change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would, again, be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these, and many other numbers, have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, the universe must be life permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a life prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a life permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence suggests that fine tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that, odds are, life-permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable, observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine tuning. Given the implausibility, of physical necessity or chance, the best explanation for why the universe is fine-tuned for life may very well be it was designed that way. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Isn't that awesome? So it could have been a chance. No. Nope. Could have been aliens. Nah. -uh. 
God is the one who created the heavens and the earth. The fact that we are here is a testament to his goodness and his greatness. Just the fine-tuning factor of the universe alone has led many astrophysicists and atheists to abandon atheism and believe in God or some kind of higher power. One of the guys quoted in that video, Fred Hoyle, he actually became a Christian because of the fine-tuning of the universe. He just couldn't deny there must be a God. If there is a God, who is he? And when you start asking questions like that, it leads you to truth. You're looking for truth. You find the best source of truth is the Word of God, what we call the Bible. As Christians, we can love God with our heart and our mind. We observe the world around us, and science is useful. It's not our enemy. It's a good thing. God is the one who gave us the ability to reason and to think and to test theories out. Christians and skeptics have the same data but different interpretations. I want you to understand that. We're looking at the same world, but we're interpreting it differently. Skeptics and atheists, atheists often say it's all chance and we just evolved from nothing. Christians say it's too amazing to be a chance. And there's proof that we as mankind, we're different and there's a specialness to us. The Bible tells us why that is. Scientific evidence supports our faith in God, even when sometimes scientists who interpret the evidence don't. You need to know that. And so I'm trying to encourage you today that when you hear different theories or findings from scientists, and it seems like it doesn't line up with what the Bible says, as a Christian, don't panic. Relax. Just sit down, smile, and just repeat after me. Just say, we'll see. <laughs> Time will tell. It really will, won't it? In the end, we're going to find out. And I know, I believe, we're going to find out that everything that God's word has said is true, often in ways we couldn't have even imagined. Theories come and go, but the word of God remains. So as Christians, we don't want to try to make science fit the Bible. But we start with the assumption and the belief that the Bible is the Word of God, and then we can look at science and interpret it in light of what God has said to be true. Again and again, the Word of God is proven to be true. So whenever you hear someone scoff at God or use science as an excuse to not believe in God, I want you to realize people don't have an intellectual problem with the Bible, they have a moral problem with the Bible. The Bible. Because the Bible clearly tells us that there is a God and his standard is perfection and none of us meet that standard. That we've all sinned and that we don't measure up to God's standard and that we can't do anything to save ourselves. That's what the Bible tells us very clearly. And if you're living in rebellion against God and you don't want to accept him, then you don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. So people grasp at straws for any excuse they can find to not believe what God has spoken. But when you look around the world around us, you see that it's very clear that mankind, as the Bible says, is broken. We've been corrupted by the curse of sin, and that's why we kill each other and steal from each other and lie to each other and hate our neighbors that all these sins make us equally guilty before God. And they're serious. And that's why Jesus came into the earth. God became man. Jesus lived a perfect life that we could never live in a thousand lifetimes. He was innocent, and yet he chose to lay his life down and be killed, paying the price for our sins. He did this so that God could be just and punish sin, but also then forgive us because the punishment had been taken by Jesus. Because Jesus rose again and Christians believe that Jesus rose again on the third day and there's so much evidence for that as well, we believe, man, that what he said is true and if we can trust that he did what he said he would do, rise again, we can also trust everything else the Bible says. Where we came from, and where we're going. The Bible tells us where we're going and how to get there. 
says there's only one way to the Father. There's only one way to be saved. There are not many ways. There's one door, and it's through Jesus. Putting your faith in Jesus, trusting that he will save you. That's where it starts. I'm going to trust you, even though I don't have all the answers. I'm going to believe what you said. Not turning off my brain, but looking at the evidence all around me, and then taking that next step of faith to actually trust that you're the answer. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. If you didn't even have a Bible, you would just look around the universe and see there must be a creator behind this. Because of Jesus, we can have a relationship with God and be restored in relationship to God. God doesn't look at us as Christians and see all of our sins any longer. He can't see them because the blood of Jesus has covered our sins. So he sees you, and when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're adopted into his family. You receive eternal life. You have the promise of an eternity with God. Man, as Christians, we can have so much hope. We can have so much peace, because life is short. The Bible says it's here today and it's gone tomorrow. We don't know how much time we have. This could be your last week on earth, some of you. We don't know. We hope not. But as a Christian, I know that even if I die, I don't die. I live because Christ lives in me. And I'm going to receive a new body and I'm going to rule and reign with Jesus for eternity in the new heaven and the new earth that the Bible talks about. That life goes on for believers and it's better than anything we've experienced in this life. So if you're a Christian today, I want your faith to be strengthened. I hope that maybe in some way you got just a little booster shot to your faith to trust that science does not contradict the Bible, but actually supports the Bible. And then if you're not a Christian, maybe you're here and I believe it's not by accident and you know maybe deep in your heart that you're not right with God. Maybe you have some kind of religious background or you went to church a long time ago, but in your heart you know you're not yet right with God. You know when you're right with God because the Holy Spirit changes you and you have inside of you a knowledge that you're a child of God. Your spirit cries out, Abba, Father. You know how I know that I'm a Christian, that I'm saved and going to heaven? Because the Bible clearly tells me how to be saved. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not might be, not maybe, not well, maybe if you're a good enough person, you will be saved. And so you can have 100% confidence. I want that for everyone today. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes just have a moment of privacy right now. And I just want to say, if you're a Christian, trust God. Trust his word. You can trust what he says about creation because he was there. (laughs) You can trust what he says about the origin of man and the origin of the universe because he did that. We can also trust where he says we're going and all of his other promises are true. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, I just want to talk to you for a moment. If you're not a Christian yet, but you know, I want to be a Christian. I want to be saved. I want to know. I want to know. Then right now you can pray a prayer with me and just put your trust in Jesus and know that you're saved and forgiven and going to spend eternity with God in heaven. Pray this prayer with me. Just agree with me in your own heart. It's not a magic prayer, but it just expresses what's in your spirit. Just say, God, I need you. I know that I've sinned and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. And I believe that Jesus rose again and that through faith in him, I can have eternal life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for leading me. I'm gonna follow you from this day forward in Jesus' name, amen.